You look weary. Come close. <laughs> I am the teller. Tales of wonder. Tales of light. And dark. There are all manner of stories here. So come. Sit by the fire. Let me tell you a story. Hello. 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 Welcome to the fire. It's a special Halloween edition of the Come Sit By The Fire short story podcast. We have two tales of terror, madness, and dreams. And the first tale comes from the teller known as Jack Woolock. In this story, a man ravaged by disease seeks refuge in a heartless and dangerous city. May I present Tremors. Seeing a spire rising above the skyline, he quickened his pace, eyes darting from alley to alley. Greeted only by the empty homes and boarded up windows of a dying city. As he pushed on, the steep, twisting street began to straighten little by little. All was silent except for the thud and echo of his boots falling on the cobbled ground. Finally, it was there before him, on the crest of the hill, a great stone cathedral peering through the mist. He tripped and fell on damp stone, gripping his hands against his side, convulsing left to right in pain and frustration. When he could finally let go, he raised a palm covered in a reeking mixture of blood and pus. The man pulled out a scarf from inside his coat and wrapped it tightly over the leaking sores, wincing as he rose. With the incline lessening, the street began to open up until it led to a large plaza, in the centre of which stood the wondrous cathedral. He stared for a moment in the shadow of his old gods, his eyes searching across the structure's huge dome and spired tower. Ahead, a wide, steep set of stairs led up to its entrance. Forty foot tall, crude planks and barbed spikes stretching across all except a makeshift door hewn into one corner. He took a deep drawer of bitter air and approached the door with confidence, drumming six evenly spaced knocks as he had been informed. It felt as if the towering building stared at him for some time. Only silence answered him while his fingers pressed desperately into his hat. Even as the mist thickened and engulfed the plaza in darkness, there was no response to be heard. Again, he rapped the door six times. He could hear movement inside. Just a shuffle, but movement. I have been told this is a place of refuge, he said. Please, let a godly man inside on a night such as this. Again, there was no response. The shuffling, however, increased. I beg of you. I have nowhere to go. I won't last long out here. Can't you find it in your hearts to let a believer among you? The shuffling turned into muffled bickering. But soon, a strange and screeching voice ended the discussion. Silence reigned once more. He sat by the stone stairs facing the deities that adorned the walls of the cathedral. He searched them for answers, nearly bringing amusement to his cynical mind. And there it was, the flash of eyes in a window above him. Please, I know you can see me. Look at me. I do not tremor. I am not one of them. I beg you. I have a wife and children. 
Perhaps they are among you. The eyes were gone as soon as they had appeared, and the cold, hard door stood silent still. He sat again, this time looking away from the impenetrable walls, and towards the sea of crooked and disintegrating roofs below. In one hand he held his hat, the other clutched over his ever-throbbing sores. Hours passed as he contemplated his next move. The city gates had all been bolted shut. He'd been ejected from every nook and cranny he'd ever had the luck to come across. Perhaps there was a way through the walls, a passage of some kind. Either way, the open plaza was filling him with an imposing sense of discomfort. Before he could rise, however, he heard them. The unmistakable march of heavy footsteps pressing down along the tight streets leading up the hill. He could already see the flames of their torches glowing through the maze of slums winding downhill. He scrambled back up the steps and rapped at the door in quick succession, pleading desperately. Please, you cannot leave me with them. You know what will happen. You've seen, he shuddered, then banged at the doors again. If there truly is life after this one, you'll be sure to find reckoning amongst the flames. Still, no answer came. They were filtering into the square now. He could see the undulating outline of their mangled bodies and warped faces, weapons flashing in the torchlight. The man fell to his knees against the door. He attacked it until his knuckles bled. Darting round every few seconds, he could see them approach the stairs, cackling, drawing nearer and nearer. He clamped his hands around his eyes. This could not defend from the attack of pestilence on his nostrils and the din of a thousand grunts closing in on his eardrums. He thought of the years he had wasted, the lonely, loveless life he had led. Without warning, several bony hands gripped around his shoulders began to drag him along the stone violently. As the door slammed shut, he opened his eyes to a grand vaulted ceiling that melted into the darkness above him, lavish carvings leading up into the blackness. All around him, wide-eyed faces approached his supine body. Old women and children alike all came to get a closer look. A boy in tattered clothing offered him a hand up, which he took gladly. He was surprised to be surrounded by at least a hundred people around the great hall. Mostly young boys and girls all sat hunched around makeshift beds, illuminated by candles on the floor, a handful replacing the barricades behind him. He thanked the boy as he was led to a bed of his own. A screeching sister reprimanded the other curious children to let him rest time for questions would come. Still wide-eyed, they all stole glances at the man as he made himself comfortable. Some of the emaciated faces even smiled at him, and one toothless boy offered him a beaker of some hazy-looking liquid. It was not until the assault started that the wandering eyes fixed sharply on the door and away from him. All huddled together in groups, Old hands shielding young ears, they watched and waited as the barricade shook and the deranged jeers began. They hacked violently into the wood, laughing maniacally. Here and there, dull yellow eyes and necrotic, shaking flesh broke through the chips in the door, and a miasma began to force its way inside. The man shut his eyes and let weariness overcome him laying carefully over his tremorous right arm. If he believed in such things, he would have asked for forgiveness. Even if prayers were to be trusted, he thought, he would wish only for the sickness to warp him before the defences fell. And with that, he slept. Our second tale 
a man who lives amongst the dreams, the different dimensions of the world just one step outside our own. He'll come to realize that there are more nightmares out there than he thought possible. May I present Astral. I had always dreamed, every night for 25 years. My mother used to call it a trip to our own desires. My college professor used to call it the manifestations of our subconscious. As for me, I just called it elsewhere. I loved it as a child. I would settle down at night, and while my brother slept like a log in the bunk bed above, I was anywhere. As a teenager with some intoxicant in my system, I escaped the hell that was my day-to-day -day life. In time, I became fully lucid, complete control. My partner, Chantel, said she'd never seen me happier than when I was asleep. Always smiling. Sometimes, I think she's right. But lucidity had begun to lose its thrill. Overindulgence and freedom leads to gluttony and boredom, and I longed for more. I feared I had gone as far as I could go, until it was late. Chantel was already asleep. She was always up earlier than me, and always in bed many hours before I joined her to take my nocturnal journeys. I was watching a film, some C-grade sci-fi channel thing. The main character was able to leave his body, travel the world in the spirit realm, or so they called it. I was skeptical, but intrigued. Astral projection, they called it. The ability to step outside your own body and walk among the stars. I felt excitement. Excitement like I hadn't felt in years. Like a new adventure awaited me. I found a convincing enough technique tied to lucid dreaming. It came with ardent warnings to watch and protect my silver cord at all costs. Supposedly an anchor between my spirit and my body. It did make me laugh. It took me only one night. One solitary night. And I was separated from my body. It started in my toes. I felt the tethers between the small bones shake loose. Then my legs, once heavy, now felt light and weightless. In my chest, the breaths and beatings of my heart, once rhythmic and synchronized, now fell quiet and still, lifting me away from them. My arms, tools for action, fell still and superfluous. Then slowly, after what felt like years, I rose upwards, like a cloud forming in the upper echelons of the heavens. I don't know how to describe it. To see yourself. Not a reflection. Not a photograph. But to be stood outside yourself. A full physical separation. The only thing connecting the two clasped in your own hands like an astral buoyancy aid. But I didn't do this to look at myself. I did this to explore. Those first few nights I tested the waters, down the streets, to the beach a few miles from my home. But I didn't take this step to walk my own town, the same streets I had walked for years. Nor did I do it so I could remain on these same shores. I wanted to go further, into the great unknown, to great heights, 
in the furthest depths. I was spending almost every hour of the day in my astral form. Do you know what freedom truly feels like? We think we do. We so believe that we do. The laughable notion of free will and freedom of movement and choice and consequence that we brandish around ourselves in this world is a cruel joke compared to this. To this real freedom. There are worlds inside worlds inside worlds inside worlds. And while we laud our own as the one that is a gift, we could scarcely believe that it is merely one fragment of an entire structure. A sliver of a complex and wide-reaching universe. The body that kept me in your world felt like a weight. A dead weight of meat and blood. Nothing more than a walking, talking, organ machine. Outside of it, I was a god. Why had I resigned myself to it for so long? I wonder. In time, as I drifted and soared through the kaleidoscopic fabric of dimensions, I began to forget I was even tethered to it. Until one night, I felt a tug. Like a child pouring at its parent, I felt the silver cord in my chest pull me hurtling back to where that vessel laid. It had never done that before. I was in control. Always in control. It hurtled me back into that room of stasis and I saw a shadow. A shadow atop my sleeping hollow body. Clutched in its hands the silver cord I had laughed at so recklessly. The silver cord that had felt like a lead weight around my neck as I barraged through the full spectrum of reality and order, which now felt like my only tether. This shadow clutched it tight, its formless and chaotic figure an absence of light surrounding my sleeping body. Why so shocked, friend? You did your research? Read others' tales of the dangers of this folly? Well, here's your proof. Don't go flashing this silver the world over. It might catch someone's attention. I grabbed at my own spectral chest where the cord was connected. What was once a solid, pure line of connection was now frayed and chipped. Weak. Yes. Yes. They all say that it shan't sever, no matter what you do. But most who have flung themselves from this world to the next did not do it with the rapidity and frequency you have, the shadow said. What? What do you want? I stammer. The shadow appeared to grin, its black, formless face shifting into a grimace of darkness as it ran its hands over the cord. Please, please. You may have acted like a fool, but please don't play as one. I want this vessel. You clearly wish to no longer be bound to it, and I am more than willing to take it off your hands. I stepped forward in a bid for my body, but the shadow raised the cord upwards, strangling it. No! I shouted. That's my body, please. Take another step and it will be lost to us both. Now tell me why you want it. The shadow said. I clutched my face with my spectral, sweating hands. Why? Because it's mine. It's, it's where I belong. The shadow seemed to grow larger as it spoke, still lacking a structure and order to its form. Where you belong, you belong to the air, my friend. To the passing winds and shifting tides. 
If you belonged to this form, you would have never neglected who was beside you. The shadow motioned towards the empty space of the bed, which once held the sleeping and loving form of Chantelle. She... she didn't understand what, what it meant, what, what it felt like, I say, shaking, feeling myself becoming unbound with every passing second. No, it is you that never understood what it meant, always looking for the out, the exit sign, when everything you needed was inches away. A whole world. It took me far too long. The shadow moved forward into the light, the absence of its form finally taking on an image, a physical presence, my own. But I know now, and I'm taking my life back. Atop my body, I look across the room at my phantom self. His face, clutched in fear, slowly warped. The mouth curled into a grin, the lips stretching further and further than possible, as the white teeth tumbled and dropped, dancing on the floor like piano keys. I look at the silver cord in my hands, the anchor point leading to my body. The vessel kept so far from me for so long. The shadow across the room wailed as he lurched towards me, body disseminating into darkness as I severed the cord. I slipped downwards, suddenly, as if the world lost all form as I merged with my body, the shadow breaking apart inches from my head, howling a guttural and soulless screech of loss. For a while, a period of time unknown, there is only darkness, no dreams, no lucidity, no bounding across the ceaseless and endless spaces of the two worlds in which I had inhabited and been imprisoned. I fear that it has not worked, that instead of returning to my body, I have instead become untethered further than before, no longer searching desperately for my home, but lost from it, barred from it, for good. But slowly, Ever so slowly, light returns. The sun rises in the distance through my bedroom window, and I feel the familiar and missed sensation of my physical form. I feel the small and slight movements of my wriggling toes. I feel the dull weight of my legs shifting restlessly below me. My chest rising and falling with the intake and expulsion of breath and the low thrum of my heartbeat. My hands and my arms rising like once felled trees lifting me upwards to greet the warm and comforting embrace of the sun. And then slowly, after what feels like years, I place my feet on the ground and stand upwards. I reach out and touch the cool glass of the window the sun's warmth permeating through it like a wave. For a moment, it feels false, like a collection of visual and physical representations of past experiences. It feels like a dream, a dream I never want to wake up from. I turn back to the bed and reach down to the bedside table and grab a phone that lies there waiting to be used. I dial the number and it rings, the gentle chirps and buzzes sending vibrations through my ear into my brain, shock waves of anticipation and worry shaking me to my very core. You answer, your voice soft, gentle and surprised. Honey, I say, the word passing my lips tasting sweeter than its namesake. I know. I'm sorry. I'm awake now.
And so, fire dies. We will return in a fortnight, as we always do. Be sure to look up the rest of the Come Sit By The Fire, the short story podcast tales. The fire continually burns on many platforms. SoundCloud, Stitcher, iTunes, Spotify, YouTube. Be sure to journey over to WorkStoriesRepeat.com for more stories, articles, and essays. Fire also burns on social medias, the digital fireplace that is Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. We'll see you again by the fire. Farewell.